You know, it's about doing those small things to help people, even when maybe you don't have much and you've been going through something hard yourself. And、um, yeah, I, I think that that for me encompassed Budo completely. Welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio, and you're about to hear episode 202. It's a good one. Today, we're joined by Mr. Ron Amram. You're gonna like this one. At Whistle Kick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on traditional martial arts two times every week. Welcome. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the founder of Whistle Kick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to all of you returning listeners, and welcome to the new listeners out there. Do you have hands? Do you sometimes put sparring gloves on those hands? If the answer to both of those questions is yes, you really should check out our gloves at whistlekick.com. They're the most comfortable gloves you will ever wear. They're durable. They're tournament legal, and they're available in five, soon to be six colors. Get a pair; you won't be sorry. When I first learned of Mr. Ron Amram, it was on his blog, which is part of his school's website. As I read through an article, I found myself nodding along, feeling like he and I could have had the same upbringing. I was reading an article written by someone who understood not only the traditions we hold dear in martial arts, but also made some space for improving on those traditions where it made sense. Which is why I'm so pleased to have him on the show today. Mr. Amram is kind, open, funny. I enjoyed my time with him, and I hope you do as well. Mr. Amram, welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Great to be here, Jeremy. Thanks so much.、Awesome. I'm a big fan. Well, <laughs> thanks. Obviously, you mean a fan of the show and not me, because because I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy with a microphone <laughs> who people who have have continued. To listen to, I I don't know why.、Uh, I, I have to assume it's it's because we get great guests like yourself that come on and and are willing to give up their evening in this case. Because listeners, <laughs> if you can't tell, there's a bit of an accent there. Our guest today is is not from within the continental United States, which is lately we we've had a fair number of international guests, which is cool. I'm I'm really digging that. So, thanks for giving up part、right. of your evening and and making the time to do this. Uh, my pleasure, and you know, I think、uh, part of the reason that people continue to listen is because you do、uh, really great work. I think with getting people who are happy to talk about martial arts, regardless of you know of, of style or organization or affiliation, and there's there's no、um, you know there's no politics, and it's it's all just about the art, which is what it should be. Well, th- well, thank you, and th- that that is the goal. There's enough politics being discussed in everyone's daily lives. Regardless of where you are, we don't need to bring any of that in here. We're just, you know, I, I think we're a large community of people that love what they do, and I'm glad to see that that as the show grows, people are realizing that we are far more the same than we are different, which was one of the goals at the onset. Absolutely, hundred percent right. Cool. <clears throat> of course, we're here to talk about martial arts. We're here to talk about you and your martial arts journey. Hear some stories, and I'd love to get started by knowing. Where your story originated? What's your martial arts superhero origin story, if you will? <laughs> All right. So、um, I grew up in Israel, and、um, you know I've always been a fan of martial arts when I was really young. You know, so I grew up watching you know like Van Damme and、uh, Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee and those kind of movies,、um, and always been fascinated with it. In fact, one of my my very first memories as a kid is of my older brother. Uh, teaching me and my sister how to do the crane kick, you know, the the infamous crane kick from Karate Kid,、uh, in the kitchen. And I remember going to school the next day and you know telling everybody that I know karate.、Um, so、uh, yeah, I did a bunch of martial arts growing up.、Um, I did、uh, fencing for a while. I don't know if that classifies as a martial art or a combat sport, but、um, I did it for a while and really enjoyed it. Competed in it for a little while and and did well.、Um, I did. Shotokan Karate when I was really young, just at the local community center for a little while.、Um, I did Aikido with、uh, one of my my best friend's dads was a, a third dad in Aikido, and we used to just get together and train in his garage every week.、Um, so I did a whole bunch of this stuff,、um, and then this was kind of growing up, probably up until about about、uh, until I was about fourteen or so. Uh, and then my dad got really unwell. He had cancer. He passed away, and I just became a, a pretty angry and rebellious teen, and started getting into a lot of trouble in school and stuff like that.、Um, and 
a couple of the, you know, it's funny now that I'm thinking back about it, I was thinking about, you know, telling this story and, and telling about a couple of things that happened. And it's only now, you know, like 20 years later that I'm kind of connecting some of the stuff to the stuff that I'm learning now. Um, but essentially, I got into a, a couple of fights uh, in school and found that the stuff that I was taught wasn't working for me. Um, and it could be, you know, it's probably a lot of it had to do with with my own learning. You know, I was I was immature and I was young and probably not advanced enough to actually apply the, the any any of those techniques or or the skills in a real con uh, real life context. Or maybe it was the system, or maybe it was the teacher. I don't know. Probably a little bit of all of it. But you know, I found that um, yeah, you know, I, I essentially got beat up pretty good, mm. <laughs> and uh, the stuff. I thought was going to work didn't work. Um, and that didn't click for me until very recently, kind of connecting that to a lot of stories that you hear about, um, uh, stories and discussions, I guess, about what is combative and what is self-defense, which I think there's a lot of discussion about that going on at the moment. Um, you know, kind of martial arts communities. I saw a really sure. interesting uh, discussion the other day about is Aikido still a martial art? It was a really interesting podcast mm. um, with some high-level Aikido experts discussing it. Um, but yeah, so that was one part of it was that I felt that, you know, the art that I had learned up until that point, although not to a high level, um, but relatively consistently over, you know, a period of time, let me down. Um, and... One of the other things that clicked, I remember another incident when I got, you know, got beat up by a kid. Um, and then he stood up and kind of was bragging to his mates. And I stood up and I tapped him on the shoulder. And when he turned around, I hit him with a really hot straight run and ran away. Um, and um, I think same, I was like 13 or 14. Then one of the things that I realized then was that um, sometimes being sneaky uh, is better than learning any technique. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So, um, you know, after that point, I kind of felt like I, I didn't really, uh, I was let down. I, I didn't really train anymore. Um, and yeah, I stopped training in the martial arts. Then we moved to Australia when I was about 16. Um, and I'm going to say, you know, I stopped training, but I was still watching a lot of movies and I was still really fascinated by it. I just didn't have any inclination to train anymore. And, um, you know, I had a very sedentary lifestyle. At that point, I became like really uh, overweight and I was drinking tons of like soft drinks and eating junk food all day. And I actually weigh a lot less now than I did 20 years ago. Um, so anyway, when I moved out of home, I was about 18 to 19. Uh, my cousins and I um, used to go to the video store every weekend and, you know, just get all the cheesiest old school martial arts VHS tapes we could find. Um, and it was some of the best times ever. You know, we'd spend hours at the shop just going through all of them and, you know, watching, you know, Kickboxer 4 or, you know, Blood Sport 3 or all the ones that even the people who, like, the, the original actors were given up on and didn't want to yes. do them anymore. Yes. Um, <laughs> So they were fantastic. We used to love it. And um, I just remember in one of those, we stumbled upon the very first UFC event on VHS and um, took it home, watched it. And, you know, our jaws was on the floor going, how did we not know about this all this time? And then I think I went back the next day, next day and, and rented everything they had um, and just watched it incessantly, like over and over again. Um, and, um, yeah, you know, I went through a phase after that where I was uh, a bit of a fitness junkie, um, still wasn't doing any martial arts, but, um, I was, you know, I was going to the gym every day and I was running and I was swimming and I was doing a lot of stuff. And I think in terms of confidence of me being able to handle myself, being, you know, a, a 20, 21 year old who was going out you know, on a regular basis to nightclubs and stuff like that. I felt that because I was fit, I have the ability to defend myself. Kind of seem, you know, I think there's probably a misconception with a lot of guys. You see some dude who's like, you know, six foot four and he's absolutely ripped and he's, and he's benching, you know, whatever he's benching or, you know, deadlifting, whatever he's deadlifting and you go, wow, I wouldn't want to mess with that guy. 
um, and it's got absolutely nothing to do with um, with fighting ability. It's just, they look scary. Mm. Um, and um, if I can kind of backtrack a little bit and yeah. maybe tie yeah, that to what, geez, to what I was saying before about those arts uh, feeling like they've let me down when I was when I was a bit younger. Um, and then, you know, finding that maybe a cheap shot was the better way of doing things is um, one of the, I guess, pillars that, uh, two pillars, I suppose, that, that we have in, in training that um, one of my sensei, Dr. Gav Schneider, talks about a lot is the difference between attributes and skills. Um, and I can't remember if maybe uh, your interview with Gershon Benkeren, I think he might have said something similar. Um, in fact, Gershon was actually on on my on the grading panel when I got my show done in Prague. Oh, cool! <laughs> yeah, in, in fact, I'm. Yeah, it is. Uh, not only that, I'm actually I'm I'm going for my knee done in two weeks, um, and um, he's going to be on the grading panel for that as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's funny. He lives just you know a few hours away. I haven't met him, and you're the other side of the world, and you'll you'll have hung out with him twice. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's an awesome guy, and he's a phenomenal instructor. You know, he's he's such a good teacher. Um, but yeah, so one of the things that Gav and and Gershon talk about quite a lot is the difference between attributes and skill. And when we look at stuff like attributes, you know, you're looking at physical attributes. You know, speed, strength, um, timing, ability to control range, uh, chin, all that kind of stuff. And when we look at attributes, we look primarily at the, the techniques that you know and how well you can apply them. And one of the assumptions that we make when um, when we deal with, or I guess that I that I make when, when I teach Krav Maga or self-defense is that um, everything else being equal, attributes trump skill, right? So if you've got two combatants, right? Uh, they're both, let's say, 30 years old, the same height, same weight. One is an absolute beast he's super fit he's super strong um you know he can control timing really like yeah he's got really good timing he can control range really well he can take a hit and doesn't care but his technique is god awful you know can't throw a punch to save his life the other guy you know when he's shadow boxing he looks amazing everything is super clean everything is exactly as it should be it's textbook but he's unfit he's scared you know he can't take a hit he, he can't hit hard so if you put those two in a fight who would win and most people would say well the first one and i agree um and i think that ties a lot to um you know i work a lot with with uh, personal trainers and and you know i was a personal trainer for a while as well and that common misconception that going to the gym is going to be able to make you uh, be able to defend yourself because you're strong and you're fast. And I guess there is actually an element of truth to it as much as, as a martial artist, I'd hate to admit it, um, that it's not all about skills a lot of the time. It is just about the attributes. And if you get somebody like that, um, you know, some of the guys that I train with who are beginners and are not necessarily skilled, man, I don't want to fight them. <laughs> They're horrible to fight. Yeah. Um, Anyways, yeah, so I, I uh, digressed a little bit. So, um, Di digress all, all you want, all you choose to. Fantastic. We're getting into good so, awesome, yeah. So, um, going back, you know, I was about 21 and I was fairly confident. I was, you know, I was fit, I was going out a lot, and, um, all was well and good. And then, um, I was, uh, I started to go to university, study music when I was. You know, I can't actually remember now. It would have been 24, maybe, 25, 24. Um, and this is actually something I haven't shared with, with uh, a lot of people before, so it'll be, you know, hopefully I, I can get through it without getting too emotional. Yeah. Um, Take your time. But um, you know, I was studying music, and part of going to a music academy, I think, is that you get exposed to a lot of things that go behind the scenes with music, with playing live shows at clubs and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, I got into a lot of drugs and I got into a lot of trouble and, um, you know, I kind of the relationship I had at the time completely fell apart because I was pretty much off my chops. I don't know if that's an American term as well. It's an Australian one. 
Not, um, an, not an American term, but I, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, um, you know, I was getting into a lot of trouble and I was doing a lot of drugs and kind of in a really bad headspace. Um, for a few years, um, and then I, I found uh, Sensei Noah Greenstone um, through a girl I was dating at the time. Uh, she had a great kid, and he was doing jiu-jitsu. Um, and I ended up taking him to class a couple of times, and I thought to myself, wow, I really should get back into martial arts. This looks so cool. And I had a chat with Noah, and I started training, and that was the point for me where my life kind of did a 180, where I went from, you know, from when I was pretty young, just getting into trouble all the time and, you know, getting into fights and generally just not being a, a great guy, um, to finding something that I found gave me purpose, um, something that resonated with me, I guess, you know, on, on a physical level and on an emotional level and on a intellectual level. Um, yeah. And then I went from, you know, from not doing martial arts or not having done martial arts in probably 10 years to training two, three hours a night, six nights a week. Um, you know, I became completely obsessed. And, um, yeah, so I've been training with, uh, with Noah for this would, this was in 2000 and, Seven, I think so about 10 years now um, and then uh, we decided to open Combat Arts Institute about five years ago it'll be actually it'll be five years next week oh cool happy so, anniversary yeah <laughs> thank you very much um, and uh, yeah so I, I been training with Noan that was primarily in Danzanru Jiu Jitsu and Krav Maga uh, and Filipino martial arts all of which I, I still do and really love um, and then, uh, through Noah, I met a few other teachers, um, that I still train with quite a lot. And, um, you know, it's funny a lot of time, well, at least to me, but I, I hear this discussion around martial arts quite regularly in terms of, you know, the kind of the unification or, or the harmony or the balance of the body and the mind and the spirit. And I think different teachers resonate with maybe different aspects of those. And for me, there's kind of th those particular three who've had the biggest influence on me as, as a martial artist um, are very much connected to each one of those. Um, you know, Dr. Gav Schneider, he's, he's, everything he does is technically, I, I dare use the word flawless, even though I know we shouldn't as martial artists because nothing's ever perfect. Um, but his technique is just phenomenal. Uh, everything he does is picture perfect in, in, and in almost every aspect, you know, whether it's striking or stand up grappling or ground fighting or using weapons or anything, he's, he's just phenomenal. Um, and that kind of the connection to the body for me. And, um, there's a gentleman I train with by the name of, uh, Manny DeMatos, master Manny DeMatos. Um, and Manny is like a master strategist. He, I don't know anybody who can think faster on his feet. Um, and you know, a lot of time if, I don't know if you've dabbled in Brazilian jiu-jitsu at all, but um, one of the things they talk about in BJJ all the time is, you know, the ability to think three, four steps ahead of your opponent and, and strategize your game and, and really think about uh, how, how to implement your own uh, battle plan in a match. Um, and I don't know anybody who can do that better than Manny, even though he's primarily a boxer. Um, you know, he has this this just absolutely phenomenal neck for, for strategy and um, being able to read people and reading tells. And it's fantastic. Every time you do a session with him, um, you know, you come away going, I can see myself getting better almost instantaneously, which I think is the sign of a, of a great teacher. <clears throat> um, and lastly uh, is Noah, who's, uh, you know, my, my sensei and my business partner I've been training with for so long and I think Noah just exemplifies the the spirit of, of Budo and the values of Bushido you know he's completely Budo, Budo personified mm. um, so yeah so those three have had you know kind of like the, the body the mind and the spirit for me um, 
And I think the thing is that that's really important with all three of them is they're all phenomenal teachers in their own way. They're all very, they teach very differently, but they're all phenomenal teachers. And I feel that for me, um, I think uh, actually you mentioned in one of our previous chats that you know on one of my blogs I have this this blog that I write about a lot and there's uh, this um, article put up about why you should read up your instructors in training. Um, a wonderful article. We uh, I'll make sure those that get, that one in particular gets into the show notes. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, that one actually came about after I was kind of going against uh, well something that I've been told a lot growing up as a martial artist, which is you should not spar with students because, you know, if they beat you or if you, you know, you don't perform, then sometimes you can lose students or, you know, your reputation gets hurt and all that kind of stuff. And I get it. Fair enough. But also the environment that I train in, I'd like to think is very much not like that. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that I talk about in, in, in this blog or this article is, you know, everybody finds their own path in the martial arts in, in different things. And as, as much as I would have absolutely loved to, and I guess I'm answering another question now as well, um, to have done a lot of martial arts competition, um, you know, I got into martial arts relatively later in life. You know, I didn't start properly training until I was 26. Um, and the last three years I've had, you know, a lot of injuries and just, yeah, not a lot of, not a lot of luck with competition. Um, and I found my vocation as, as a martial artist, primarily as a teacher, mm -hmm. which I absolutely love. Um, and I think it's, um, yeah, you know, super important, you know, martial arts is supposed to be taught, yes. it's supposed to be passed on from, you know, from, from person to person, from sensei to student, from senpai to student, whatever it is. And that's part of the beautiful relationship that we have that, you know, we transmit knowledge and we adapt and, and we grow and we learn together. Um, but yeah, um, I think that's a very much where I end up where people ask me, what it is do you do? And I say, well, I'm a martial artist and a teacher and sometimes a teacher first and a martial artist second. I want to roll back because there were, Please. there were a couple pivots in your life that, I want to dig into it because I, I think they're important to understanding who you are as a person, which of course, who you are as a person changes, but that affects who you are as a martial artist. Absolutely. So, so here you are, you're, you're a young kid, you're learning martial arts and then your dad passes yeah. and anybody that's lost a parent, anybody that's lost anyone important to them knows that that can be a very transformational time. Sometimes it's a really good thing. Sometimes it's the opposite. And it sounds like, excuse me, losing your father set you in a very different direction. You mentioned you were, you were angry, you were getting into fights, you weren't training. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, no, you're, look, a hundred percent right. Okay. All right. It's, it was, um, it was an event that I think for me, look, my, my dad was a, a very uh, powerful um, and almost imposing figure. He was um, ridiculously intelligent. You know, I think he had like an IQ of like 190 or something like that. Um, and what he did for his day job was to run a school for gifted kids. Um, so there was always this expectation at home um, to, to live up to a certain standard in terms of, you know, performance at school and stuff like that. And sometimes it was implicit and sometimes it was explicit. Um, but, you know, up until that point, I was, I was a straight A student. Um, and I think when he passed, in a way, I felt that I had to rebel against anything that was, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, orderly or structured or, um, yeah, relating to anything like that, 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 that give, anything that gives you structure. And part of that was training as well. Sure. And you went in the opposite direction. You know, you talked Absolutely. about moving from Israel to Australia and not being physically active and putting on weight. But what I found interesting through there is you still had some tie to martial arts. You were still watching a lot of movies 
and then you pick up UFC one. What we didn't hear about was what changed your your sedentary lifestyle. Was it watching UFC one? Did that click for you, or was there something else that got you off the couch? Um, actually, no. It was my cousins who I was living with at the time. Um, they were both always very fit. They didn't, you know, play sports, um, you know, like any any uh, group sports or anything like that. But they were always really active. You know, they used to run a lot, they used to go swimming a lot. They had a lot of mates uh, in school who just, you know, they'd get together and play uh, Aussie rules football or or rugby or you know or tennis or anything like that. Um, so when I moved out of home and I moved with them. Um, they invited me a couple of times to go work out with them. And um, they said, why don't you come with us? We're going to the local pool. We're just going to do laps. Awesome. No worries. So I came down. I think they did 20 laps each. And I got through, you know, like four. I, I wouldn't even call it swimming. It was like, you know, drowning with forward momentum. <laughs> um, um, I think I got through maybe four laps before I was like, nah, this is this is not happening. Um and then a couple of days later, they dragged me down there again. And this time I got through a little bit more and then through a little bit more and then through a little bit more. And, um, you know, within a few weeks, I was doing quite well and, and maybe not technically as a swimmer, but persistent nonetheless. Um, and, um, yeah, I just became a, a bit of a fitness junkie from there. You know, all of a sudden I found that, you know, I started losing weight and I got a bit more confident and. Um, you know, like meeting girls was easier or talking to people was easier. And, um, I think that that reflected in a lot of other things in my life at the time, which I think, you know, just like martial arts does, even though it wasn't directly that is, you know, once you start being a bit more active and you, you know, you lose that first pound or, you know, you get that first stripe on your belt or you do something like that. All of a sudden you ask yourself, wow, I wonder what else I can do that I always thought I couldn't. And for me, that was the point where all of a sudden, you know, I've gone from from failing everything in high school and barely scraping through to, you know, doing really well in university. Uh, you know, I got top scores for a lot of the units. I got invited back to to teach as a lecturer pretty much as soon as I graduated. And, um, you know, I actually worked at university for about 10 years after that. Um, and it was it all had to do with that. And I think it's one of the most empowering thing about martial arts is. Um, I think it was uh, one of your guests, uh, was it Phil Knight, perhaps, um, who said that the hardest thing you're ever going to do is um, step on the mat for the first time and put on that white belt. Yeah. I, I can't remember who said it, but it was no, one I, of I think guests. you're right. I think it was it was him. That definitely was a recent episode. Yeah. They, they um, blur for me a little bit because they, they don't always come out <laughs> in order. And, and uh, yeah. Sure. No worries, but no, it's a hundred percent right. And um, but you know, I think the beautiful thing about it is that once you do that, you know, all of a sudden you go, "Wow, that's something I thought I could never do. I wonder what else I could do that I always told myself I couldn't, or that somebody else told me I couldn't." It's certainly a powerful realization to know that what we are capable of is so much broader than what we believe. And and one of the things I found is that that continues to be true. There's there's no one wall that we break down to say, oh, I I thought I couldn't do that, but now I can do that. But this is all I can do. There all there are no boundaries. There are no walls. We can just keep pushing forward. I mean, you don't have to watch too much sports on television to see how the human body is evolving. You know, whether that's mm. weightlifting or martial arts or, you know, professional basketball or, or anything. I mean, people continue to push those boundaries and the human body, the human mind is, is pretty exceptional. Absolutely. A hundred percent. But, you know, I think the thing that's interesting is that I find that those changes almost always start with a physical change first. Mm. Um you know, like you, you go for a run or you take a class or, you know, you do something. It's almost always, uh, at least that's what, that's my experience has been, you know, and with people that I teach as well. It almost always come from achieving something on a physical level first. But then once you, once you think about it and, and 
give it a bit of time to sink in, then translates into something more. Right. Okay. And I think a lot of it, you know, we're, we're, I, I could be wrong, could also be my understanding of how you learn martial arts. You know, to start with, you learn technique before you learn everything else. And the better you get, the more you think about that technique in, in context, you know, um, how to apply it, where can you apply it, how can you apply it, who against, in what situations. Um, and it's one of these beautiful things that, you know, the more you learn, the more you realize how much you don't know. Sure. Um, and, and breaking it down into even smaller and smaller components, you know, and if I, I draw back to music, you know, it's kind of like looking at um, the subdivisions of, of, of rhythm. You know, you start with whole notes, then you go to the semiquavers, and then you go to eighth notes and 16 notes and 32s and 64s and so on and so forth. And the better you are and the deeper your understanding is of the art, the more you can see those those small, tiny, minuscule gaps or, or pauses or facets of, of everything. And that's also something you can then apply to life. But again, I think it always starts as, as a physical manifestation first. We've heard a lot about you w within the last time, however long it's been yeah. now. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we got a little bit more than your origin, right? We, we've got a lot of who you are and, and you did a great job of connecting a lot of the dots. And I'm crossing out some of the questions on my list because you've, you've already answered them. Cool. We've got a good sense of, of your path. And I want to thank you for being so open in sharing the things that you shared because some of that stuff is, is difficult and very private. So it, it means um, a lot to me that you're, you're willing to do that. Oh, my absolute pleasure. And, you know, I think it's, um, like I said, my journey is, it's, it has been that, and I think it's been a great one. Um, and if I can, like I said, you know, I always think of myself as a teacher first. And if, if I can help people through my experience to, to, you know, either learn from my mistakes or to help them through something that they're going through, um, then that's what it's about. If sharing that uh, helps them happy. We've heard a, a bit about some of the, the non-martial arts things that you were into at, at various times in your life. But how about now? Now that you are a very different person, and, and I hope it's okay to say that, but it sounds like you've Absolutely. transformed quite a bit in, in, in physical ways and in, in likely emotional ways. What does your life look like outside of martial arts are you, are you are you still involved in music do you still play sports do you still go to the gym are, are there other things what are you passionate about that isn't martial arts um i, I was kind of dreading you getting to that question <laughs> uh, for the sole reason that <laughs> not a lot um i you know my life revolves around training at the moment i'm um uh, you know like I, I run a dojo um most of my mates are from training um, and I am, I think part of the reason that I've always had, um, you know, that I've had a lot of the experience that I've had is, um, that I'm a very, I guess, ob obsessed, maybe is the right word, individual. Um, when I find something I like, I'm like a dog with a bone. And as, as, uh, you know, Noah usually says, my, my sensei is, uh, I don't have a dial. I have a switch. It's on or it's off. You know, there's no 30%, there's no 50%, there's no 70%. I, I do it a hundred percent or I don't. Um, and with martial arts at the moment, it's, it's completely encompassing for me. You know, even if I sit at home and I've had a long training session and I'm tired, I'll be watching TV and without thinking about it, my hands will start running like, you know, Filipino stick patterns or something like that. Um, the good thing is I have a very forgiving wife, <laughs> very understanding. Um, so she's, uh, she's, uh, yeah, <laughs> she's happy to let me do my thing. Um, but um, what other things? Look, um, I've always been a very keen learner. Um, other than martial arts, I'm always I'm always reading. I'm always writing. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in university. Um, you know, I've, I've got degrees in in finance and music and fitness and security and education, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, in, in fact, I was just recently looking at re-enrolling university again for a master's in criminology. 
just for, you know, a bit of fun. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm, I'm always reading and writing. Um, I, I like to spend a lot of time um, with my cats. I'm, I'm kind of a bit of a crazy cat person. <laughs> Um, that that I would not have expected. That that's uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, huge fan of comic books and anime. Um, so you know, again, it comes back to to reading a lot. Mm. Okay. Um, and I think that's I think, and again, I'm, I might be uh, preempting here by not one of the, one of the questions that you often ask is about is about books, um, and you know. I I read incessantly. I usually have two or three books on the go at any time, um, and I I go through them quickly. You know, it's always always keen to learn and absorb as much as I can. Have you always been um, a big reader? Yes, very much so. Um, and I think that's something I got from my parents. You know, you're walking in my mom's house, and it looks like a library. Mm. It's just it's books everywhere. Um, in both my mom and my dad, and both my brothers and sister are all the same. All right. The, yeah. the picture of you is becoming clearer, isn't it? We're, we're starting to, to plug in more more holes. I want to talk yeah. about stories now because you you gave us a bit of surface stuff. You know, went a little deeper on some things, and I know a lot of the stuff that you hinted at can go deeper. I'm not going to pretend to decide which one is is the best one to share. But if I asked sure. you to share your best martial arts story, what would that be? Sure. So, um, you know, I had a list of a couple. And if I can, if, if you don't mind, if I can go through one or two, and maybe then you can decide which one is uh, is worth sharing or share both or whatever it is that you reckon. If, um, if you're struggling to decide, give us both. Fantastic. So one of the things that I think a martial artist has to ask themselves at some point in their career is, and I hinted that with me being a teacher, but the other thing is what is it that you're training for? Is it for the sake of the art? Is it for competition? Is it for self-defense? Um, you know, what, what are you doing this for? Um, and for me, it was always self-defense comes first. And that's something that I still hold true to very much. Um, you know, when I train and, you know, I, I, I cross train a lot, like my, my main, uh, martial arts is obviously Krav Maga, um, but you know I, I've got a, a showdown in Dungeon Jiu Jitsu, and I've been doing Filipino martial arts for you know I've never graded in it, but I've, I've been doing it for seven or eight, nine years. Um, in the last few years, I've been obsessed with boxing, so you know I and I've been doing BJJ, and I cross train a lot. But for me, whenever I train in, in a new style or I go back to visiting something I haven't done. Uh, the focus is always how can I apply that in if I had to fight for my life. Um, so an intense story that uh, was when I was working bars. Um, so, um, yeah, so I was working uh, doors for a little while you know, as, a, as, a, as a bouncer and being not a big guy. You know, I'm six foot, uh, six foot, sorry, five foot eight. I was going to say six, eight. Uh, <laughs> I was going to disagree and, with you being a... <laughs> <laughs> Not a big guy then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, 5'8", and, you know, about 75 kilos, and I'm I'm not an imposing figure in, in any shape, way, or form. Um, and working doors for me was really more of a professional development uh, experiment, I guess. Um, you know, I'd been training in, in Krav Maga and martial arts for a while, and um, the, the hard thing about learning self-defense is that you don't have a place where you can test it right you can't go into a competition and go okay i'll see if i can you know if i can win or i lose or how how well i win or how badly i lose and then i adjust and i try again um you know you can do pressure drills and you can do simulations and all that kind of stuff but it's never going to be exactly the same um so at that point when I decided to go work doors, I was actually uh, a lecturer at university. I was teaching finance. I already had, uh, you know, I was, I was still teaching music um, part-time in the evening and stuff like that. So I had a career and, you know, I was earning good enough money and I didn't need it. But one of my instructors was saying, well, if you're in self-defense, you should probably get some frontline experience. So I went out and did a security course. And I ended up working as a bouncer 
um, just to put myself out there and, and see, you know, if, if something happened, yeah. if I could deal with it. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, I was the kind of bouncer who would go and just beat people up. In fact, I, I hardly ever had to put my hands on anybody because I'm, I'm, I'd like to think I'm pretty good at talking to people. Um, but sorry, I'm, I'm digressing again. No, uh, no, long story no, short, there's um, one particular uh, incident which really uh, was etched in my mind um, where I was working at a nightclub where we had um, a lockout at a particular time. So after that time, you're not allowed to let you know people in, even if they've, um, sorry, new people in, unless they've already been inside. So if they had a stamp, you could go in and out. Otherwise, not allowed in because the bar's about to close. Sure. Um, and it was past that time, and one of the guys who was working at the bar went out and brought some girl back with him. Um, so he obviously could get in. She looked like she was, um, you know, very well intoxicated and looked as like she had been taking drugs all night, you know, was definitely not all there. And she wanted to get in and she started acting up when I told her that she couldn't. Um, and she ended up, um, taking her shoes off and, you know, throwing them at a couple of bystanders. And then she found a can of Red Bull that somebody had thrown on the ground. It was empty. And she picked it up and she tore it in half. And then she jammed one of those half halves uh, in her wrist and slit her forearm completely open. Um, and, you know, there's blood gushing everywhere and she's running and she's smearing it on the side of the building and she's shouting at people. Um, and then she looks at me and she goes, you didn't let me in. This is all your fault. And the scariest incident I have ever had in my martial arts and security career was not fighting big dudes, was this little five foot five girl in a dress running at you with a bloody can going, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to murder you. Um, and, you know, I, I just like we, we dealt with it. You know, we managed to, to restrain her and, you know, call the police and sort it all out. But I got home and just the absurdity i guess of, of the situation kind of dawned on me um once i had a chance to calm down and think about it a little bit and it's um it's interesting the kind of things that get a, a response out of you know that the thing that scares you the most is not what you thought it was going to be you know because going to work in security or going to work doors you're going oh man what if there's some dude who's huge and he's gonna you know he's gonna get aggressive and i have to throw him out totally was not the case mm. um and those ones were always relatively easy to deal with. And yeah, so, so that was one story which was um, pretty intense. <laughs> That's heavy. That's some heavy stuff there. And I, I'm, I'm wondering about the psychological impact for you. I mean, was it, was it hard to go back the next day or your, um, your next shift? Or, or how did you handle that? Well, it was there's there was a few things that were difficult about it. I think on a personal level, you know, having gone through, like I said, you know, going through a period of of going through addiction, um, seeing somebody else in that state of mind where when you have to, you know, to to try and restrain him is that's a that's confronting in its own right. Um, and you kind of say, "Wow, was I ever like that?" And I don't think I was, but um, you know, on an emotional level, that hit me quite hard. Um, the other thing was that, um, you know, some of the things she was shouting, which you get sometimes when you throw people out is, you know, you don't know who my friends are, you don't know who my family is, you better watch your back, you know, walk into your car tonight or, you know, we'll find out where you live and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, that night definitely when I was, you know, when I, my shift was over and I was walking to my car, I was, I was looking around and I got into my car and I drove off quickly. Um, and I think it was not long after that that I decided that I was, um, you know, I've been doing it for long enough. I think I got what I was going to get out of it. And I can go back to just focusing on teaching martial arts and, and um, you know, get back to my day job without thinking about it too much. Um, yeah, so it wasn't long after that that I think I was kind of reached that point where I was like, I don't want to deal with violence on a, on a regular basis. And what's your other story? 
Um, so the other story is, I guess, not so much a martial arts story per se, but a story that I feel has a lot to do with Budo, um, you know, with, with warrior spirit or the values of, of martial arts. You know, um, uh, about a year and a half ago, this is the end of 2015, my wife and I uh, went to Japan for the first time. Um, when only time, but I'm sure we will go back. Uh, and we absolutely fell in love with the place. It felt like home, you know, almost immediately. Um, and we spent a lot of time walking around, um, as I think you do in, in Japan and Kyoto specifically. You know, there's a lot of temples and a lot of things to see. And you can get a bicycle or you can get a, you know, a bus. It's quite easy to do, but we just liked walking. So we walked everywhere and, you know, we'd walk probably a dozen Ks a day and, and it was fantastic. And there was this one day we had both, um, we didn't have a good day, <laughs> you know, it happens sometimes. I had hurt my ankle in a competition just before we went over and it was giving me a lot of grief walking and my wife wasn't feeling well. Um, and we had walked into a store just to, to get a cup of coffee while we were, you know, gathering our thoughts before we continued walking. Um, and this was at a bottom of a hill. Uh, quite a large hill, and this uh, old Japanese man who was, I uh, know he would have been, my guess would have been his late seventies or early eighties, who was walking down that hill, and you know he was walking very slowly and uh, taking his time, and he comes into the shop, and my wife and I are sitting there, and we're not talking, we both look a little bit sad, and um. You know, just drinking our coffee, and he comes and sits there and looks at us for a few minutes, and then he opens his bag and just takes out a couple of biscuits and just gives it to him. He didn't speak any English, and he just gives it to us. Um, he said something in Japanese which I didn't understand, and I just said, you know, "Arigato gozaimasu," like "thank you very much." Um, and he just smiled at me, and then he got up and he started walking back up the hill really, really slowly. And my wife and I just sat there and we looked at each other and we both just completely burst into tears. It was the most beautiful display of just spontaneous kindness to somebody who just looked like they needed it. Um, and not necessarily a martial arts story, but something that to me stuck, um, you know, like that, that's a story I'm going to remember for the rest of my life, as, as my wife says as well. Um, but I thought that to me, completely encompassed what, what training is about. You know, it's about doing those small things to help people, um, even when maybe you don't have much and you've been going through something hard yourself. And, um, yeah, I, I think that, that for me, encompassed Budo completely. That's a great story. And, you know, depending on how you define martial arts, that, that either is the heart of martial arts or, you know, maybe it's not. Either way. It's it's a great story, and it's yeah. clear that it's had an impact on you, and For sure. uh, you know you can can just hear it in your voice. And I've had a couple incidents like that in my life where you just kind of have to look around and say, you know, was was that just that person taking you know taking some pity or, or offering me some kindness, or did this in incident have a a broader connection? You know, whether whether you know you term it spirit, God, you know, the universe, however you want to look at it. You know, I look at situations like that and think maybe, maybe this is about more than a biscuit right now. Yeah. <laughs> I think you just nailed a great quote there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. So now, sorry, if, if I can backtrack again, cause yeah, uh, by all means. I, I don't, so going back to the other story I had before, um, I actually had this in my notes, but I seem to have skipped over it. Um, one of the other implications of, of the, uh, you know, the crazy Red Bull can wielding lady um, was the connection, I guess, that, that had to my understanding of what self-defense training is. You know, I'd experienced violence before, uh, but I think that was the first time there was literally something who somebody who was going to kill me um, had they had the, the opportunity um, first and last, <laughs> thankfully. Um, and 
again, one of the thoughts that I had when I got home, um, because you asked about that before, was would my training, when my training did actually prove useful, but if I had not trained the way I trained, would I have been able to deal with a situation and get home safely? And like I said, for me, the focus on, on training had always been self-defense comes first. Um, so whenever I'm learning a new technique, I'm always thinking about, you know, street applications or self-defense applications. And, um, but the other, uh, the other thing that, that is really important with that is that when you look at that incident as a whole, not necessarily, you know, the girl grabbed a knife and slashed it, you know, the number one angle on that side and you had to do a block and trap and restrain and whatever, um, is what happened before and after. And I think again, um, you know, uh, Sensei Gershom Ben Karen talked about it quite extensively about how do I identify how do you identify the signs that something is about to happen, and how do you include um, incorporate the escalation and, and verbal diffusion techniques in your training, and um, how do you deal with um, you know the after effects of adrenal dump or the legal aspects of, of being in a fight and um, and having to hurt somebody uh, to defend yourself. And I think that that's something that's often neglected. Um, and, you know, I think with, with Krav Maga specifically, and I'm going to go on yet, yet another uh, detour here. Mm, please. Um, <laughs> you know, like I said, I'm, I'm first and foremost a Krav Maga practitioner, which I think is a controversial martial art, I dare say. Um, you know, some people don't classify it as a martial art at all. They say, you know, it's a self-defense system, which is totally fair. Um, and I think... It has gotten a bit of a bad rep with, um, you know, having a lot of uh, bogus practitioners and charging hefty fees for just joining associations and, and stuff like that. And a lot of time when I go and, you know, cross train and people say, you know, what are you doing? I say, well, primarily I train Krav Maga and go, oh, so you just keep guys in the balls. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, no, there's a little bit more to it than that. You know, sometimes you like, punch them in the balls. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, um, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a little bit more complex than that. But I think that's one of the main points about learning martial art or learning self-defense, and they can be the same, and sometimes they're not. Is dealing with those things that happen before and after. It's not just the person throws a hook and you block and counter and implement your, you know, your game, so to speak. It's a lot of time, how do you avoid being there in the first place and how do you talk your way out of it? What do you do before, during, and after? Not just, not just that. Um, and not everybody teaches that and not everybody claims that they, you know, they know how to and not everybody thinks it's important. They're all totally valid. But I think that also means, it also brings up a really important point about whether you know what it is that you're training for and whether you know where you should be training to get that. So one of the things that I thought was important, um, and again, I've got a blog about this as well, um, which was about finding the right martial arts school for you. Because I went through a period where I trained through uh, quite a few places. And some places I loved and some places I didn't like as much. And it wasn't until a few years later that I'd, you know, kind of sat down and, and really wrote down why that was now that I had a little bit more experience and that I was getting new students as a teacher um, and trying to give them an accurate and honest, uh, you know, portrayal or, or, or description of what it is that I can offer them. And, you know, when, when most of the time when you go, when people start with the martial arts, Almost every martial art advertises, you know, come and get fit and learn self-defense and learn a cool art and meet people. And not every place does all of that. Um, and that's fine, providing that you know what you're doing, you're providing the right service. And that, I think, gets compounded by the fact that if this is the first time that you are starting with martial arts and you're going to find a new place, you don't really know what it is that you should be looking for, you know? Most of the understanding I think that people have of of martial arts and of violence comes through, um, you know, dramatized violence on TV. You know, so we see 
choreograph fight scene. But if you've never really seen a fight, you assume that's how it happens. Um, or, you know, you watch combat sports and you decide that you want to go and compete. You know, I think especially now with UFC and BJJ being as prominent as they are, um, there's a lot of people who come in and say, you know, I want to compete. I really look up to this fighter. I love what they do and I want to be that one day. Fantastic. But what you see when you see on TV is you see that fighter going in and, you know, they have a fight and they win or they lose. And even if they get knocked out, you know, the ref will wake him up and it'll be okay. And you touch gloves and everybody's fine. But you don't see the, you know, the three months of, of camp leading up to it. And you don't see the brain scans you have to get if you get knocked out after and all that kind of stuff. Hmm. Um, so I think as, as a new person going to study, you, you don't really know what to ask necessarily or what it is that any style, every style can offer or what's involved in training. Um, and again, as a teacher, I think that's, that's one of the most important things is to really be able to identify um, what are your strengths and your weaknesses as a martial artist and within your martial arts, martial art, and, and make sure that your students are aware of that. Yeah. Very, very good points. Very good points. And, um, you know, folks, the, the writing that Mr. Amram has on his blog, I mean, just, you know, there are a lot of martial arts blogs out there and quite often, you know, when, when I'm, evaluating somebody for the show, whether, you know, I'm reaching out to them or, or, or they've reached out to us. I'll do some research just to kind of get a sense as to who we're talking about, whether or not they should come on. And I'm a busy guy. I, I think everyone understands that, but excuse me, the blog posts that you have up, I read and I enjoyed reading and I read them to the end. And I don't usually do that. I usually kind of get a sense as to what's going on. Okay, I'll, I'll skip to the next thing. But I found them really interesting because of what you're saying and the way you're representing it. And that that was why I was so happy to have you on. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, when I first started writing uh, a few years ago, um, one of my teachers who I mentioned before, Manny DeMatos, who's, uh, like I said, the, the master strategist, he does a lot of seminars around the world and he writes for magazines on a regular basis. And one of the things that he encouraged me to do um, when I started writing was uh, make sure that you write stuff that, you know, will get a response. Cause um, I, I, you know, on one hand, you don't want to say anything that'll, that'll, you know, make people angry and you don't want to rock the boat and you don't want to say, you know, I don't want to offend anybody or anything like that. But on the other hand, Sometimes you have to say things that will get a response for people to read it. And I think it's, uh, for me, it's about trying to find that balance between the two of saying what I feel that I need to say while, um, yeah, you know, kind of walking that tightrope of uh, making sure that the message gets across, even if you don't like it, but without it being too uh, abrasive. And sometimes saying something controversial is good, even if you know that your opinion is in the minority or, you know, there are times not so much with this show or, or with any of the writing I do related to whistle kick, but there are times when I teach, when I will teach things intentionally kind of wrong, trying to get people to think, you know, as far as I'm concerned, anytime you can get people, whether they're, they're training or reading to consider, to argue for their position, you know, they're thinking they're developing their skills and maybe they're considering the other point of view, mm. but to, to get them to look at what they believe and why and question it even for a second, I think leads to better development. I mean, you, as much time as you've spent in a university, I'm sure you can appreciate that mindset that, you know, thought is important. Absolutely. Without a shadow of a doubt. And I think that, um, I think I'm, sorry if I step away for a sec. Uh, feel free to cut me off if I'm talking too much. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. You're doing great. <laughs> uh, thanks, buddy. Um, yeah, I think especially now when um, people, and maybe this is the point where you got to differentiate between information and knowledge. You know, thinking about about what you're doing is is a crucial part to learning. You know, critical reflection is 
I find the difference between people, especially in martial arts, between students who will get better um, and students who will not, or students who will get be- better quickly and students who will take a long time. Um, you know, we, I always encourage my students to, you know, to, to ask me as many questions as they can, especially the ones that, you know, most instructors don't like, which are the what ifs. Yeah, but what if the guy does this when I do it? And what if the guy does that? Great. It means you've thought about it. Perfect. Um, but I think especially now, you know, it seems like, <clears throat> yeah, the differentiation between information and knowledge is that knowledge is instantaneously available. You know, we've all got smartphones and if you need to know something, you Google it or you find it on Wikipedia or you look up a YouTube video and the assumption is that once you've done it, you know it, but you don't really have to retain any of it because it's so accessible. Um, and I think that I saw in, in my time teaching in university, I could definitely see a shift over 10 years in the way that students were approaching, you know, the university studies. But I've also seen the same thing sometimes with young people in martial arts, where the focus is on instant gratification rather than, um, sorry, let, let me rephrase. It's more about um, uh, breadth than depth. You know, mm. it's about, okay, how many techniques am I going to learn today? Rather than get one technique and do a thousand repetitions until you, you, you've nailed it, you know? Yeah. Um, because the assumption is that once I've been taught it, if I forget it, I'll go on YouTube and look it up again. Yeah, and, th- and that kind of uh, forgets the, the, some of the important non-physical aspects of martial arts, right? It's, it's in the 10,000 repetitions that you start to develop the personality, the mental, the emotional, sure. spiritual even traits. You know, you don't develop yeah. those when you, you practice a particular move 10 times. 100%. A hundred percent. And you know, the, they say the pen is mightier than the sword for a reason. Mm. Um, and, you know, when you look at, I think at a lot of the, the great martial artists, and I think one of the, the perfect examples of that is, um, you know, Miyamoto Musashi, who is a, a, obviously a phenomenal samurai and, and, uh, and, and fighter, but also a very accomplished writer and artist, is that, you know, the greats are the people who do that. Are the people who, you know, not only train, but think about why they train, how they train, um, you know, make notes and develop that way. Yeah. Let's move forward. Let's, Please. let's kind of bring it back almost full circle. You know, early on, we talked about movies and, and actors and how influential they were, not just in your martial arts, but in your life. And, and even though you didn't say it, I'm going to guess that that connecting thread through your time of not doing any training of, of still being interested in martial arts movies. I, th- I think there was something more to it on some level than just entertainment. I, I think it was, oh, absolutely. I think, you know, when someone starts training, I think martial arts becomes a part of who they are. And the fact that you ended up training again, uh, to me is no accident. When you think sure. back on all those martial arts movies that you've seen, do you have favorites? I mean, it sounds like you've probably seen all of them. Um, I've seen a fair few. Um, yeah, there's a couple. I think one of my absolute favorites is The Raid, um, both the first one and the second one. Have you, have you seen those? I've seen the first one. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I was at the first time I saw it, I was absolutely gobsmacked. Um, it was such, other than the fact that I really enjoyed the film itself, um, I thought it was by far the, the best fight choreography I've seen in a very, very, very long time. Um, you know, it was fairly graphic, but it was, it was, I thought it was absolutely spectacular. Um, and the other thing that I really enjoyed about it was, you know, they did a lot of stuff, which was obviously, you know, cinematic, you know, techniques that are really flashy and cool, but every so often they just throw something in there. You're going, wow, you know what? That would actually really work in real life, um, which is really cool. They do all these flying spinning kicks and cool throws and block flows and this and that. And every so often they just do like, okay, now I'm just going to block and I'm going to crack the guy a couple of hard ones and move on. Um, <laughs> which, you know, which, every time I saw it, I just kind of had a smile and go, yeah, okay, wait. Yeah. Um, so I thought it was a nice balance of that. And obviously the guys were, were fantastic martial artists. Mm-hmm. Um, the other ones that I've recently really enjoyed were the, the uh, Undisputed series with Scott Atkins. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, I think there's, I think there's four of them. And um, it's interesting, they, they, the movies progressively get worse, but the fight scenes progressively get better. Um, that happens quite often, I, it seems. It, absolutely. Um, I think those movies kind of stuck, stayed true to the, the old school feel of, of proper martial arts movies back in the 80s and 90s, where, you know, you'd pick people based on their martial arts and athletic prowess rather than acting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So those are, yeah, I, I think they're great. <clears throat> awesome. Favorite actors? Um, Scott Atkins at the moment, as I was yeah. saying before. I, I think to me, he kind of feels like the new Van Damme. You know, he's um, he does a lot of those kind of movies. That's his niche. You know, um, he's obviously a, a phenomenal athlete. He does some really, really cool stuff. And um, most of the stuff that he's been in, I, I really enjoy it. Nice. Let's talk about books. You know, we... I'm sure the listeners are guessing that you, you've probably got quite the library yourself. You know, you're you're a writer. You enjoy writing about martial arts. You've been a big reader your whole life, and martial arts is a passion. Yeah, you got quite the martial arts book library. I'm guessing. Um, I do. I have quite a few. Yeah. Um, a library in general and martial arts specifically. Yeah. Sure. Well, if you had to pick a couple to recommend to the listeners, what would those be? Um, okay, so my absolute favorite is uh, Zen in the Martial Arts by Joe Himes. Yeah. I think it's an absolute gem. Um, it's the way he captures really complex concepts and is able to, you know, explain them and share them in a way that it's almost instantaneously applicable to your own life. Is, I've, I've, I've never read anything like that. Um, you know, it's yeah, it's something else. It instantaneously takes you in, and it's got a, a really kind of warm tone to the writing. You know, it feels like it's your friend from the second he starts writing. Um, and yeah, you, you can read anything in that book. You know, all these little anecdotes, and you can take you know years to think about each one of those. But it's stuff that, for me, I could say, wow, I can apply that to this and this and this now. Yeah, it's an incredible book. One of my favorites, and we even did an episode on it. Uh, 146 yeah. for anybody that, yeah. that might be newer to the show. Yeah. It, um, there's, there's a, a brilliant simplicity, I think for me in that book in that it's, there's a tremendous amount of content, but it's easily digestible. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that one, uh, that, that sensei Noah often says, um, he's, you know, is a, and I think that's true. The simple techniques that are always the hardest, you know, to learning how to, to throw a proper punch or how to do a, a proper cut with a sword is something that can take a lifetime to master. And I think that's exactly what he's done there. He's taken that one punch and that one cut and just said, here it is. Simple doesn't mean easy. Exactly right. And those, that's in fact my, pretty much my favorite saying of all time. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, just because something is simple doesn't mean it's going to be easy to do and vice versa. Okay. And another book? Um, the, the Book of Five Rings by Musashi. Yeah. Um, that one Classic. I don't think is an easy one to digest. <laughs> no, no, it's not. <laughs> not at all. Uh, that's the kind of thing for me that, you know, I've, I've read it several times over, you know, over a decade or so, but and usually I'll, I'll read a little bit of it, you know, every night or every few days, but it's something that you can read a passage and leave it for a few weeks and think about it, think about it some more, and, you know, read it again and think about it some more. So, yeah, it's, it's amazing, but it's, it's not easy reading. <laughs> What's keeping you going? Why are you still training? What's, what's in the future for you? Um, the immediate future is I've got my uh, second Dan grading in two weeks. So, so I'm actually, uh, you know, um, trying to get myself in the right mindset for that. Um, but uh, the long run for me is just to keep training. You know, it's, it's to keep learning. I think that's that's really what it is. I, I love training. There's no happier place for me. Um, especially when I'm boxing. It's been my passion the last couple of years and, you know, just get me to put on some gloves and, and have at it. And I'm, 
as happy as can be. Um, so to to keep learning, really, that's that's all it is. Just to, to find out what it is that I don't know. You know how much more I don't know because there's heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps. Um, and then um, try and scratch the surface of that. Hopefully, you can do that in a lifetime. Yeah, that's a lot out there. And if people want to get a hold of you, if they want to find your website, your blog, find you on social media, maybe how, how would they do that? Um, so uh, the easiest way to do it is to go to our website at Combat Arts Institute of Australia, which is www.caia.com.au. Um, you know, pretty much everything's up there. So my blog is up there. Our contact details are up there and everything that we, uh, that we do at Combat Arts is there. Okay. Um, and uh, on social media, just look up Ron Amram, come down, say hi. Nice. All right. I want to thank you for your time here today. This has been great. You went, you went deep, you were open and things that I, I always enjoy in our guests. So thank you for that. And I'm hoping I might get you to indulge us with just one last little bit, you know, some parting words of wisdom. Sure. So first of all, thanks very much for having me. It was an absolute pleasure. And uh, if anybody, anybody who's listening got something out of it, then, then it's an honor and a privilege. Um, I guess the most important message um, is to never stop learning. Every time you step onto the mat or a step out onto the street in life, there's something for you to learn. Um, and I think if you focus on that and just at the end of every day, just go, what did I learn today? However small and insignificant it may seem at the time, as long as you're doing that, you're growing. I love talking to our international guests because while they do bring some different elements to the table, they reinforce that as martial artists, we have far more in common than we do separate. Thank you, Mr. Amram, for coming on the show. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with a number of great photos, links to his blog, which you really do need to check out, as well as links to his school's website and their Facebook page. You can find us on social media, at Whistlekick on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and everything else that you can probably think of. You can also check out the show's Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. Just do a quick search in Facebook. It's going to come right up. If you're ready to upgrade your sparring gloves, now's the time. Check out whistlekick.com. Free shipping on everything in the domestic U.S. and reasonable shipping. We don't mark it up. Everywhere across the globe. Thanks for joining me today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.